The Iron City. The Steel City. The City of Champions. America's most livable city. Call Pittsburgh what you want, but we call it home. We're Dave and Dave, and in this show, we want to share with you what we love about Pittsburgh. So we're going to show you the quirky things that are uniquely ours, the familiar things we all recognize, and yeah, even the things that sometimes drive us crazy, but bind us all together. And we've invited a group of Pittsburghers that you might recognize to help make our case for why this is one of the greatest cities in the country. Okay, maybe even the world. So now the only thing left to do is figure out a title. Yeah, what do you call a show that celebrates all the cool things about Pittsburgh? So Dave, I can think of no better way to start this show than to talk about Pittsburghese. I mean, how many cities can say they have their own language? So what is Pittsburghese? It's our slang, it's our, it's our own little language, you know. Uh, it's something we understand uh, that no one else does, and I think we're just very protective of it. We're very proud of it, and uh, it is just a, it's, a, it's our form of the English uh, language. Well, I don't know if we can even call Pittsburgh a, an English language at times. It has its own brand and uh, distinction. Did some research on the subject, and it has a lot to do with our European roots. I think it's just a combination of the native languages of the people who first came here, and I think it's kind of like a spun together version of like your Eastern European languages and a little bit of Appalachian. It's truly just Pittsburgh, nowhere else even in the Appalachians, but yins and stuff like that, you'll hear that down into West Virginia and farther south. I didn't think it was anything unusual growing up. Are you trying to get me to do a Pittsburgh accent? You know, as I got older and, you know, went to college and everything, like, oh, okay. This <laughs> guy's going down to Donzie's and that in your Bonneville. Someone were to say, um, are you going to the supermarket today? A Pittsburgh would say, are you just going down Giant Eagle if you're going down there to pick me up by a pound of chip ham? I will admit that when I hear a guy use yins six times in one sentence. What are yins talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, it does bring a smile, and we talked about setting the all-time record. You would call it Pittsburghese. Everyone from Pittsburgh would know that it's Pittsburghese. And it's funny because I've actually tried to explain yins to people from outside of the city before, and I've tried teaching them different Pittsburghese slang words, and they've actually used them in sentences and then carried it on outside of Pittsburgh. So I think I'm trying to spread it as much as I can. It's either down here or upper, depending on where it is. You know, like somebody went out of town, it's like, you, you, yes, we were in Canada yesterday. What was it like up there? <laughs> I wash, thank God, but my mom washes, and my dad goes to Washington. I mean, that's a whole new level of inappropriate speech. We went to Myrtle Beach uh, in the summer. It was a wonderful trip. What's it like down there? What's it like down there, Myrtle Beach? <laughs> Washington? <sighs> I know they say at other places, I am called Hun more in a more familiar and loving way than I have any place else in the universe. I have read up my room since I was a small boy. And I was down south, I'm like, well, I gotta read up. And they're like, read up? What, what, what are you painting? What is that? <laughs> no, I'm like, gotta clean. I read up my room, and I like that removal. Like, my room needs read up. What happened to the whole connecting phrase of to be? I would constantly get these calls, letters, and nasty messages from English teachers around the region. They'd be like, stop this. We must stop this, <laughs> as if it was a plague. We're excited about somewhere we've been. It doesn't matter where it is, it's a wild time. There are so many, and just the way we say, Clyde, Don Don, go to Stiller's game, get a sandwich, eat some jumbo in the tailgate, have some iron. When I was in college at my dorm, there was one other person from the Pittsburgh area, and it was a girl from Fox Chapel, and she was like on the ninth floor, and I was on the third floor of our dorm. And one night she called me, and she said, Rick, you have to come up here. I said, I, I was really hungry for a jumbo sandwich. And these girls, one of them said, what is that, an elephant sandwich? <laughs> she said, no one, no one would believe that in Pittsburgh we call bologna jumbo, but yeah, we do. Could have visited France. You could say, how was France? France is a wild time. Pop, crick, um, jumbo, buggy, hoagie, babushka. Gum bands, that's another one. Now, when you're down in the Giant Eagle, do you use a buggy or a cart? 
I use a buggy, of course. I use a buggy. Is that, is that wrong? A buggy is a cart. I had a roommate from the eastern side of the state, near Hershey, Harrisburg, and we were at the grocery store, and I said to her, go get a buggy. And she's like, what? I'm like, a buggy. And she's like, I just kept walking. I'm like, a buggy. And she's like, what do you mean a buggy? And I'm like, a buggy. And she's like, you mean a cart? And I'm like, well, yeah, you could call it that, I guess. My friends and I had this tendency to go to like dive bars in the south side and then literally get into buggies and have races down the street until somebody falls out. It never ends up pretty. A friend of mine moved to Philadelphia and a friend of hers called and wanted to know how to get to Dubois, Pennsylvania. It's when you least expect it that you pick up the Pittsburgh drawler. It sort of introduces itself into, your, into the lexicon, you know, when you're talking to somebody and you say, well, you know, we were going to go down. And nobody knew what he was talking about until somebody said, do you mean Dubois? And like, that, that's, we can't even get the names of places straight. Your friend will go, did you just say down? And you're like, did I? <laughs> I'm sorry. I... People from around the country don't necessarily know that we have an accent. But once you know, it's very easy to pick up. Pittsburgh people are known as Muppiers there in Erie because when you meet somebody from Pittsburgh in Erie on the beach at Presque Isle in the summer, you say, oh, how you doing? Oh, you from around here? And they say, no, I'm up here from Zelianople. So they're all Muppiers. But I think it's also one of the charming things about the city. It's adorable. It's like it's, when you have books and bumper stickers on sayings, th that's how. Every now and then you'll hear a really good Pittsburgh accent and you'll sort of, you know, delight in it. Wow, listen to that Pittsburgh accent. A gnat. Gnat. Although when I say a gnat, I think gnat, like it's annoying, <laughs> get out of here, you know, so you got to be careful. If I were to say to you, Kennywood's open, what would that mean? It means summer's here. I'd say yay. It means two things to Pittsburghers? It does. Why, what does it mean? Problem. <laughs> Problem <laughs> below deck. <laughs> it means your fly's open. You got to zip up, buddy. Kennywood's open. Kennywood's open. Kennywood is uh, what I consider to be uh, our little Disneyland. I couldn't sleep the night before our school picnic of going to Kennywood. I was so excited. It's an amusement park that started 1898, some say 1899. It had been a picnic grove called Kenny's Grove. It was a trolley park. It was a place where you could take the streetcar to the end of the line. That was the end of the line. Get off with your picnic baskets, go in and have a picnic. And then they started to have a merry-go-round and various other rides and it developed into an amusement park. And we would go, at the, uh, in the early years, go in a streetcar that would drop us off and loop around Kennywood. It was a destination. At Kennywood, it's so neat that it's right there in the city. It has tradition and thrills. You don't usually think of the two combined when you think of an amusement park. You know, you're used to driving hours, taking day trips, packing a cooler to go to an amusement park. And here, you drive 20 minutes out of the city and you're like, what? This is here. There's something about the wooden coasters that's uh, magic. I remember the day that I was tall enough, I was taller than Jimbo, I could ride the Thunderbolt. That was, that was a really, really big day. Yeah, my go-to is that I have to ride the, the Thunderbolt a couple times just at the beginning. It's an adrenaline rush, so I want to set the tone for the day. I love the Jackrabbit, of course, but I think the most underrated ride at Kennywood is the Turtle. We would wait in like, you know, the longest line ever to go on the Jackrabbit or the Thunderbolt or the, the racers too. You get your friends and see who would win. Well, the turtle's great. I don't know why everyone talks about, you know, the Thunderbolt and Raging Rapids. My favorite ride at Kennywood, no question, is the auto ride. Those sort of big old bulky cars that are in those wooden troughs. It's a wild ride. You're sort of guided through these paths. It was made in Beaver Falls by the Harry L. Travers Company. It's a local ride. It's the only one left in the world. And it's, it's totally the best. Who doesn't love Kennywood? The best part about Kennywood is <laughs> when you go there, everybody shortens the names of everything. So you'll be in line and they're like, hey, let's go to the J-Rabbit. Let's go to the T-Bolt. Let's get some pea patch fries. <laughs> It's, I swear, it happens. I've never heard I have this. never it heard It is totally this. true. Roller coasters, dipping Dots, corn dogs, cotton candy, lemonade, done. I like things that you go around in circles and then have to fight throwing up. I like that. I'm, I'd rather have that than the roller coaster, actually. I'm like an old lady now. I tried doing the King Kahuna. I almost yacked. 
it's kind of like an internal test, like can I do this and get off and still have a corn dog and live to tell about it. My favorite food is the Kennywood Park corn dog. It is the best corn dog, and I am a connoisseur of corn dogs, and it is the best corn dog in, in all the world. We found out Sally Wiggin loves corn dogs. Oh, well, good, I have something in common with this Sally Wiggin. <laughs> First thing, I find an excuse to go to potato patch fries. They are broad cut french fried potatoes with the skin left on. They're deep fried in peanut oil so that they have a really mashed potato like texture internally but outside they have a golden brown finish and they're crunchy and creamy at the same time. It's kind of like when you go to the movies you have to have popcorn. If you go to Kennywood you got to get the fries at some point or it's not official. Potato patch is a must, the corn dogs, but then there was a new thing next to the log jammer. I don't know if it's still there but you could get the funnel cake sundae. And it was a big funnel cake. You get the ice cream and the strawberries and the whipped cream. Oh! And it was just, I dream about it sometimes. <laughs> when the family went, before we would leave, the tradition was you got cotton candy, and as you were walking out the tunnel, we'd always scream, bye bye Kennywood, see you next year. Aww. Aww. <laughs> we just had so much fun as a kid and an adult, you know, going, going to Kennywood. And, and I think it's one of those staples that you have to go to in Pittsburgh and, and even as an adult or, you know, grandpa or grandma, everyone loves to go back. So Dave, Julie's right. Kennywood, of course, is a great place to go in the summer, but another cool park to go to in the summer is PNC Park. And you know what? My favorite thing about PNC Park, you don't have to be as tall as Kenny the Kangaroo to get in. PNC Park, I think it is the most beautiful ballpark in America. I mean, the fact that Sophie Maslow the former mayor had this crazy idea that we'll build a baseball only stadium. She basically was laughed at and then eventually it came to fruition. Going to Pirate Games during the summer is one of the greatest things you can do with your friends. I've been to PNC Park when there was no game going on and got yelled at for trying to get inside. I love PNC Park. The first time I went there, I was surprised at just how pretty it was. They did it right. They really knew what they were doing. You know, they, they were smart about it putting our skyline as the backdrop. My favorite view now is from PNC Park. And you look out and the scenery and the, you know, the Gateway Clipper going by and the backdrop and the bridges are highlighted. It's gorgeous. I mean, I fell in love all over again with the city. Feels like it's been there a long time, doesn't it? Even though it's only been there since, what, 2001? It just feels like it's been there for many years. You got your beers, you got your nachos, you got your cotton candy, you got the dang lemon, the lemonade guy. Lemonade! Lemonade! We're crying out loud. It is very easy to get a beer and extremely easy to get something to eat. The bathrooms also have great access. Like you can get in and out of the bathrooms. Right? Those are the three things we need first. All right, they got those covered. It's like a club with a, a field on the inside. You know what I mean? It's like hot, it's sexy, it's great food all over the place. And I'm not a baseball fan, but I'm a PNC Park fan because when you go, you walk around and you eat. My favorite thing to do is eat. They have the things that we like to eat there, not just food. It's a burger out of Manny's is all I'm saying. And there's one there, you know, and it's like Bankovitz has a place there too. We love our brand names that you can't get anywhere else here because it's what distinguishes us. It's always a point of civic pride to be able to point out, can't get that where you're from, Jag. I love the nachos. I love the beer. It is the best set up party that you can't get anybody to go to. I mean, unfortunately, as soon as that beautiful park was built, uh, we were right in the middle of, uh, you know, a decade and a half of futility. I have a Jason Bay t-shirt, which is pretty much going to be used to clean my car now. If they ever become a good team, this place is going to rock because on the times when it is full, it's a great vibe. I do enjoy the team and every year at the beginning of the season it's always great anticipation saying you know this is the year they're going to do it and no matter if they do good or bad you know people still love the Pirates no matter what. All right so Kathy's right the Pirates are our team and we're going to support them no matter what and for my money PNC Park is my favorite place in Pittsburgh but a lot of people in Pittsburgh say their favorite thing about the city is the neighborhoods. And I don't know what it is about all these terrific neighborhoods we have but I do know a guy who might know. Well I think the neighborhoods it's it's our desire to be part of a small town. And, you know, we are a big city, but no one ever says that about Pittsburgh. This does, doesn't feel like a big city. It's because no matter where you live, you're part of a small town. That's actually one of my favorite things about Pittsburgh, is all these sort of little areas where 
It's a pretty big city, but it's actually really insular because each of the little communities have their own identity. Northside. Of course, my hometown, Aliquippa Center Township. Big shout out there. I just recently ventured into Lawrenceville. My brother lives in Swickley. You can't beat the Strip District. The Hill District. Spring Garden. Clearly, the South Side is really cool. I'm married to an Oakland girl, and uh, her father told me all roads lead to Oakland. It is like Rome. I love Oakland because I'm, I'm, I'm a frustrated academic at heart. And I love the fact that it's a campus, and it's two campuses actually, in the city. I think that there's a lot of history still in Oakland and Shadyside in those areas that, you know, you get uh, a lot of people will be willing to tell you the first place that Dan Marino, you know, threw up in public and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of landmark, landmarks there. Um, landmines, too, yeah. I think one of my favorites now is the South Side, because the South Side kind of reminds me of like, it's chic, but it's down and dirty, it's, it's homey. Maybe a bar every third door. You smell from sausage to kielbasa to pierogies to like the chicest Spanish food. And then you can go get a hot dog on the street, pizza two in the morning. Big fan of the South Side. I'm 26 for drinking purposes. That causes some problems, particularly late night when not all the public restrooms are open. It's also very, very neat to go back down there with my mom, who grew up in Allentown, to go down the south side with her, and she points out like the pretzel shop, like saying, you know, this is where I used to get my pretzels back in the day when I was a kid. I went through the town of Bloomfield. Loved Bloomfield. Maybe it's because I'm Italian. Bloomfield's like Pittsburgh's Little Italy. I mean, the people there, I mean, they were hugging me, kissing me, offering me food, and you know, I mean, it was just a wonderful neighborhood to be in. When you go to other cities, there's not like a Polish hill or all these other ethnic areas, so that's really cool. Polish Hill is was known for years primarily as a Polish working class neighborhood. I love Regent Square. I proposed doing a bus tour of neighborhoods at one point where you just had a driver take you to all the establishments that you're supposed to go to like Regent Square and stuff like that where you know people don't even know that Braddock Avenue has all these cool places to go to. Nobody ever knows about Regent Square. Where's Regent Square? It kind of it, it's kind of a neighborhood of Squirrel Hill. Oh, okay. Then people kind of know it that way. I think the fact that we still have little self-contained neighborhoods that have a shopping district like Regent Square or Squirrel Hill or Oakland even, um, gives us like sort of a home base within our hometown. And uh, that's comforting or it's, it's, it's easier to understand a neighborhood than it is a big city. To anybody that lives in the North Hills or is even from the South Hills, going to the opposite end is just complete and utter foreign territory. It's amazing how many North Hills people don't know the South Hills, and vice versa, because you can't cross two rivers. I think the North Hills is like a totally foreign country to me as a South Hills person. Growing up in the North Hills, you're so stuck in that little area. My family almost never left the North Hills, unless it was going to visit the grandparents in Allentown or you're going to the Mellon Arena for ice capades. I was able to uh, learn both sides. It was like, it's like learning two languages. It's pretty amazing. And I know that, you know, South Hills families split into two camps. You're either a Fort Pitt Tunnels family or you're a Liberty Tubes family. South Hills is another universe. I don't cross bridges. I don't go through tunnels. And they're pretty nice people down there. <laughs> I don't know. We never liked people who lived in the North Hills. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laying the snack down. I'm ready to go, South Hills. And we really hated people that moved from the South Hills to the North Hills. I'm a big fan of McKnight Road and that's where I stay. Now, I, I, I know how much my dad hated McKnight Road as a kid, you know, because there was no 79 when I was a kid, and if you were heading north, like to Pima Tuning, you had to go up McKnight Road, and oh, it was always a mess, it was always terrible traffic. South Hills, they can't handle the McKnight Road. They can't handle it. They don't know what all those lanes are about. At least we delineate between the lanes, which is more than I can say for them. Even now, I mean, I work downtown, sometimes I have to go south, but sometimes I'm not sure exactly where things are down there. If I'm on Babcock Boulevard, I'm lost. <laughs> I always say that. If I'm on Babcock Boulevard, I'm lost because I don't know where I, where I should turn. I worked at Ross Park Mall for seven years. And the store that I worked at was also located in the South Hills Village. So they would send me over there. And I remember going to my mom and saying, hey, mom, I'm going to the South Hills today to work. Oh, my God. Why are they sending you over there? That is the <laughs> longest drive ever. We talk all this about the North Hills and the South Hills, but we never talk about Monroeville and Penn Hills and those people. They're alive too. I don't want to have anything to do with them either. 
There's plenty of people in the South Hills. We don't need to worry about the people in the East, nor the people in the West. You know, out by the airport, Moon Township and all of that. We don't care about them either. Just South Hills. The tunnel phenomenon is part of the reason I live in the North Hills. Every day, these people go through the tunnels, and every day they are surprised that the tunnel is there. No, I think there's no logical reason why you slow down. I don't understand why you're braking. Keep it moving. I have to drive through the Squirrel Hill tunnels every day to get to and from work, and I will never understand why people have to break through the tunnels. What is the answer? They don't even do that in the Lincoln Tunnel. They, they don't even do that in, in New York City. There, if you slow down, you're a dead man. I do not drive slowly through tunnels, but I do pace myself according to the car directly in front of me. Yeah, they, um, they could close in on your car and crush it, or you could drive right into it if you don't slow down. Maintaining the same speed and direction is not a guarantee of safe passage through the tunnel. It amazes me, too, that some days the commute through the Squirrel Hill Tunnels is 15 minutes, and some days, 45. Originally, on the books, there was supposed to be a third tunnel for the Squir Squirrel Hill section of town, and they would be able to shift lanes depending on traffic. And somebody in Washington at the federal level said, oh, they'll never need that. It's no reason I figured it out. They're afraid of the dark. There's some kind of a monster that I think people are afraid is going to eat their cars, and that's why they break through the tunnels. And by the time they figure out that I don't have anything to be afraid of, you're out. And I think you can tell the Pittsburghers and the non-Pittsburghers by the people who honk on the people who slow down. I used to love, if you get in the left-hand lane of the Liberty Tubes, you can go really fast sometimes. And I always thought, hey, no one's going to stop me in here. I mean, I'd love to go 65, 70 in the left lane of the Liberty Tubes. But I probably slowed down before I got in there, too, just to make sure that there's no one in that lane ahead of me. Um, the slow people are always in the right lane, so you can always... You, I mean, often you can make time in the Liberty Tubes at the right time of day. Boy, doing 70 in the left lane of the Liberty Tubes, I don't know about that. But I do know about the guy who was doing it. That was Rick Seaback, and he's the guy who captures all of that great Pittsburgh stuff, puts them in those documentaries, and they're pretty good. This program is part of WQED's Pittsburgh History Series. Those shows are just so tremendous. <laughs> it started in 1987 when I came here. Um, and the first one was the Mon, the Al, and the O. And I think there are now, I want to say there's 21 local shows and 11 or 12 national shows. And many times I've stopped on QED on a Rick Seaback documentary, and you stop and watch it for a little bit. And then you kind of look at the person you're watching with, your girlfriend, wife, whatever, and you go, we should go down a strip tomorrow, don't you think? You know, <laughs> like he makes you go places. You're like, get out of here. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Let's go to that church in, you know, Bellevue and, and look at that Spanish painting, for crying out loud. He is, and it's the most overused phrase in the world, the perfect ambassador for Pittsburgh. People can come to us through his documentaries and see what it is that we love about this place and what it is that keeps us from leaving. He knows Pittsburgh better than I think anybody. Yeah, he knows obscure stuff. You know, he knows how deep the barges are on the Allegheny River. He knows how many floors were in the original gimbals. Like, why does he know stuff like that? He does. He knows, like, you know, the first time Joe Negri appeared on the Paul Shannon show is, I don't know, how does he know that stuff? He makes learning about the past, and a lot of people, you know, I say, I don't care about the history of the city in which I'm living, but no, he makes the past of Pittsburgh fascinating. Knowing the history of the city can only increase people's civic pride, you know, and uh, I think that he does a better job than anybody's been able to do in, in any city that I've been to, you know, even when you're in Chicago and you see the Chicago documentaries and stuff like that, it doesn't seem to have been done as thoroughly or with as much care as Rick is able to do. He's fun and he's outgoing and he just gives it to you straight and, and plus you like his voice. You ever listen to his voice? When a lot of Pittsburghers hear the word South Side, they immediately think of Carson Street. The Seaback guy's voice was in more in the early shows. If you, if you see shows like Kennywood Memories or Downtown Pittsburgh, there's more Rick Seaback. I don't want to talk about myself in the third person. Um, but in recent shows, I don't talk so much. But I watch them in the dermatologist's office because they're looped. And every time I'm there, I look up, and it makes me hungry. It makes me 
watching them, his, his exploration of the food of the region is, is fabulous. The man loves to eat, let's face it. Every special has food in it, it doesn't matter. There's food. I mean, it could be like, you know, about cemeteries of Western PA. And right by that, there's a stand where they sell hot dogs on a stick. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the documentary, but there's food involved no matter what. But the guy, he's, he's got it made. He hasn't, bought, uh, he hasn't had to pay for food or drinks probably in the last 10 years. Because he's done like eight on food alone, you know? Sandwiches of Pe Pennsylvania. You know, you know? And he's like, vegetable wraps of New England. You know, and then he goes off and everything, you know, he traveled the world on that one, like sandwiches that you like or whatever. I think in general, I love the local shows better than the national shows. But I think my favorite show is a hot dog program, which is a national show. You know, you see Kennywood Memories and, you know, you know the strip show. And you, yeah, you get a lot of, your chest kind of goes out a little bit. You notice that? Especially when I said, once again, from people from out of town. You know, you should, you're sitting here watching him, showing him, you know, some, one of his documentaries. Your chest is out a little bit, you know. And it, it's like comfort food for the brain. You know, you watch him and you really feel good about, oh, I remember that. That's real. That's the best compliment I can say about Rick Seebeck's documentaries. They are real. And he has an eye for what, uh, what is, you know, going to work out really well in a documentary and what's going to catch people's eye. He really uh, is a true artist. And, and uh, as I said, man, he is a, he's a jewel in the crown of Pittsburgh. There's no doubt about it. You know, Dave, those Rick Seebeck programs, they really are great. And I hear his next Pittsburgh history special all about Dave and Dave. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't wait. Well, Rick Seebeck, along really with anyone else around this town, knows when you say Pittsburgh, you probably think of two things. Number one, the Steelers. Number two, fireworks. If there's one thing in this city that brings everybody together, it's definitely the Steelers. We're just weaned on that team. It's, you know, you are in Steeler country when you get, you know, go to our airport, look at the sign when you get off a plane, you're in Steeler country and you are. Well, I can remember being in, you know, second grade or something and we had a big pep assembly for the Steelers and so everyone had to wear their Steeler pride and we had cheers and we sang the song and, you know, and it went on for like an hour and we couldn't wait. We're watching uh, the Steelers you know, religiously with my family and my you know, great grandmother's house on Sunday, the whole family would, after church, would be there sitting around watching the Steelers. And something you don't find in other cities is that um, we really carry the pride with us. Black and gold, right here, right in the heart. <laughs> Let's say it's game day. The one thing I notice after being back here in Pittsburgh, after being away for a couple of years, is that we don't just all talk about going to the game, but you go into the doctor's office and the nursing staff is wearing their scrubs, not green scrubs, their black scrubs with the Steeler emblem. I saw that the other day. And when you start to think about their heritage and you meet some historic players, the Franco Harris's, the Mel Blunt's, Terry Bradshaw, you're like, oh, I love them. So you can't help but love the team because you love the players and what they stand for and what they mean to the city. Even Cordell Stewart? Even Cordell Stewart, who is a very good friend of mine, so let's not talk about Cordell. I mean, it's totally emblematic of the people uh, that have grown up here. I mean, the steel industry, blue collar, hard working. I mean, literally the offense of that team is built around the, uh, the work ethic of the community. You know, a little bit grinded out, a little bit at a time. Nothing's easy. We're not going to get a big play touchdown and win the lottery. That ain't happening. We're going to grind it out inch by inch, barely get by, but we will. Defense, we're tough, we're nasty, we'll knock your head off. That really resonated with the people. I don't think ever before in the history of sport has a team's personality fit the personality of the community and vice versa. It was a perfect match. And so, I mean, you know, it's like the most reflective thing of the culture around here is the football team. A lot of the people in Pittsburgh, you can tell if the Steelers are doing bad the next day, they are angry at work. They are angry. A Steeler loss, especially late in the season or in the playoffs, is just, oh my God, it's, <laughs> you don't want to get up the next morning, you don't want to go to work, you don't want to see anybody. I, I, I think it's a part of the fabric of, uh, of the area, of the community. That's, uh, you know, they want their teams to do well and they, they want them to succeed and they're part of, of, of their lifestyle. I find that the best part about Steeler fever is the food spread at the parties. I had no idea for years I was avoiding these parties, and then I went and there was crocks of baked beans and all sorts of meats. Of course, Steelers Nation happened as a result of the steel, steel industry dismantling after four straight championships, and people went all over the country to find work, but they always sort of uh, kept up their, uh, their you know, 
um, loyalty to the Steelers. They're the number one team in the country, and the reason I say that is because we travel, we go places, and I dare you not to find a Pittsburgh bar somewhere where you can watch a Steeler football game in this, in this country and many other countries around the world, too. I just took a trip recently to Ireland, and in the smallest, remotest village, a fishing village, there was a terrible towel among all the other stuff that was all local memorabilia and pictures, there's a terrible town. I thought to myself, that's Pittsburgh. Steelers rule overall in this town. They just, uh, that's just the way it is. If you are from Pittsburgh and you don't like fireworks, then you're lying. You're from Ohio. I love fireworks. I'm like, ooh, ah. Uh. I think we like fireworks because Although you can buy some pretty nice ones yourself, you're never gonna buy them as good as like the Zambellis make them. Maybe the, the explosions and, the, and the, the, the sparks remind you of inside of a steel mill. I don't know. You know, it's better than gunplay. I mean, <laughs> that's the way I've always looked at it, you know. Maybe Pittsburghers like things that go boom. I don't know, maybe, maybe they're an explosive people. And it sparkles and and you can go outside and it's free. What's not the like? Maybe it's because there are so many places from which you can view them that make them so glorious. We have the city that looks so great from, uh, you know, a hundred different angles. In your boat, up on Grandview, Find You, Troy Hill, you name it, there's always a, a vantage point that is unique. And having fireworks at night lights it up. All right. So anything that accentuates the skyline and coming through the tubes and all that kind of stuff, that's good. We don't have uh, beaches that we can go to and have bonfires and stuff like that. So, you know, things that go boomer are cool, man. We have such a love for fireworks. You're right. The Zambelli family, obviously in Newcastle, they've been doing it for generations. The Zambellis, uh, you know, I like to keep them busy because if they're not blowing off fireworks, who knows what they're liable to do? Those people have a mastery of fireworks and firearms and gunpowder that I don't want falling into the wrong hands. You know what I'm, I'm just saying? I uh, once did a one-day job with the Zambelli team, and it's exciting. I mean, this goes back to childhood blowing up models, which is dangerous. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend that. One time I remember I visited Houston. Um, for July 4th holiday and it was like fireworks okay we went downtown went to watch them and it was like 10 minutes and it was like boom 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 and I literally said that's it it's over that was it there was no grand finale was that the grand finale well, I don't know why we love fireworks it's just it's they're, they're entertaining I don't know why they, they're 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 every two minutes aren't they uh, we have fireworks for any excuse any excuse donnie iris concert put them up or a sesquibicentennial you've got to have fireworks i mean they were all over the place at the steeler game for the monday night game you got them during the pirate game you obviously got them during fourth of july you can't do it every night because it's like all right already enough you got your light up night you got i don't know i got my hair done last night let's put some fireworks up Pirates games, and they, they, when they do a home run, there's a fireworks go off. The biggest crowds come to the games when there's fireworks. Uh, I have always believed that if the Pirates have attendance problems, why not sell the team to Zambelli? <laughs> you can have fireworks every night, have sellouts every night, and then, you know, a bobblehead night every now and again. Who will care if they were lose? I'm boycotting fireworks, okay? Every time I go, it's like these people have never seen them. And they're always like, oh, it looks like spaghetti. It looks like noodles. What is the deal? <laughs> and it's always accompanied with some sort of like, you know, I'm proud to be an American track, <laughs> which I can't handle it. I love that, you know, we love Zambali and they're, they're a part of the festivities. I love to hate fireworks. <laughs> uh, somebody joked once that they had relocated a family from Iraq near Heinz Field in PNC Park and that they actually left because it was too noisy. Well, Dave, the jury is still out on the topic of fireworks, but love them or hate them, right after this show, we're shooting some off. Nice. All right, so we've talked about a lot of great things that we love about this city. Now we should talk about two things that aren't so great. The weather and getting around. 
It is true. I mean, we have so many bridges and we have so many um, one-way streets in Pittsburgh. You know, most cities are set up on the grid pattern. It's just, you know, this way, this way, this way, all on 90 degree angles, nice and neat. But we can't do that. When I first got here, I followed the blue belt or the orange belt or the yellow belt until someone explained to me that those were designed to get you out of town in World War II in case of a, you know, an air raid and there was going to be a bomb. But I didn't know what other way. For many, many years, I did not drive, and I got around on foot and on the bus. And it was a huge revelation to me when I started driving that there are certain streets I couldn't go up because they were one way. It's confusing, and we like it that way. And explain to them why the house numbers don't run concurrently or why they're different on one side of the street than they are on the other. Because you get people in from out of town, they're so confused, they have no idea. But we know. When people come to town, or if I'm trying to give directions, I do not tell them to write anything down. If you have a nav navigation system, cool. If not, I will talk you through it. And, and then when, you know, Google, Google just the map, it doesn't work because they take you this goofy way. And, and it's like, I know a better way than Google. Half streets, there's like 50th and a half street up near the top of Lawrenceville. I literally gave my girlfriend directions. I'm like, okay, what do you see? PNC Park, okay, make a right. Okay, no, 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 don't go too far. Go under the bridge and make a left. And there are the extensions, like, you know, Formosa Way extension. What does that mean? I don't memorize streets. I memorize, oh, that's, in, that's near Heinz Hall. It's the building right across from Heinz Hall. Or I'll say that's the, that's the building right across from the convention center. I don't know the names of those streets at all. They don't know the name of that street. They never have known the name of the street, and they never will know the name of the street. Or a street will become a flight of stairs, and that's the same as pavement when they were planning the city. If you're a downtown especially, that triangle is hell trying to tell people how to get around. You just can't do it. If you don't have a GPS now, well, that's maybe the best invention ever for the city of Pittsburgh. Now, I'm not sure that'll work. You know, if you come here to this city, it's almost like, okay, which way do I go? <laughs> yeah, and we are famous for the way we give directions to people. It's like, go where Carmody's used to be and make a left at the guy on the corner selling roses. You'll try and explain it to somebody and you'll tell them to go up the hill and then down the hill and then you're gonna hit a fork in the road and you wanna veer to your left and you're gonna see a look on their face like. Sometimes we'll even go with you or follow me or I'll take you there. And then you're gonna say to yourself, but I was taught to get in my car and drive you there. And that is so neat. That is so unbelievable that how many stories have we heard over and over and over? It doesn't happen anywhere else in America, folks. I'm telling you, it does not. People have complained that Pittsburgh is a hard city to maneuver. I don't think, I think DC is a hard city to maneuver in. I keep going around the same statue all the time. You get lost. If you can get around in Pittsburgh, you can get around in just about any city in the nation. Pittsburgh weather, pros, summer, spring, fall, cons, <sighs> winter, ice, PennDOT, snow. Look, let's be honest. Pittsburgh weather is problematic, but at least we have seasons. Uh, it's not like Arizona. I went, once went to Phoenix and I watched the weather guy and the five day forecast was the same. How boring. I don't think it's cold enough here. And I'm serious. I do not like summer. It's too hot. I love winter. Really? I love winter. I always have. I like cold weather. Um, just to give you a little tip, when I worked in Florida, I worked in Orlando for three years before I moved to Pittsburgh, on Sunday afternoons, NFL football, I used to turn the air conditioning all the way down as low as it would go. I would draw the drapes so it would be dark in there and put on a jacket and watch the NFL in Florida. I am all for revoking NFL franchises in sunny cities. Here's the problem. The six months of gloom from like Christmas, you know, till June, <laughs> they can get you down because it is, it can be gloomy if you let it get to you. Like seasonal affective disorder has got to be high. UPMC probably makes a ton. The last time I checked, it was 56 days of clear skies in Pittsburgh. You can go back and you can check like each city. Some cities have 250 days. Some city have 300 days. We have 56 days of clear skies. Because of the Great Lakes to the north, the mountains to the south and east, and the plains to the west, there's a lot of forces going on here that 
change the weather rapidly, and we seem to be in one of those zones where uh, it changes a lot. So, yeah. I don't get it here in Pittsburgh. You see, I really don't understand it. People uh, talk about having 60 days of sunshine. You know, that's all we have is 60 days of sunshine. Now, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to tell people to start bragging about having 305 days of cloudy weather. You see, because you can draw a lot of interest from people. If you said that in a positive way, well, we have 305 days of cloudy weather here. You don't want to have any problem with sun, with, you don't have to worry about sunscreen. We'll make sure you don't have any problem. You want to be, if people would just be smart and have a little fun with it, I think it would change the, the outlook of how people look at this city. So remember this, we have 305 days of cloudy weather, only 60 of sunshine. Our weather people are very, very famous too. You think about it. Where would we be without Joe DiNardo? I grew up watching Joe DiNardo, and come on, our weather doesn't change a lot. What's our weather every day? Partly cloudy skies, chance of showers. I think it's actually, it should have been reversed, because partly cloudy, actually, there's more sunshine. It's less cloud cover with partly cloudy. It's only a smaller percentage of the sky obscured, whereas partly sunny has more clouds and less sunshine. If it wasn't for them, I mean, we, the city, would be a catastrophe. You know, you need your weather people to let you know what's going on. Joe DiNardo says it's going to snow. Bang, dot on the road that morning. I mean, there's probably, you know, once every seven years we get a big storm like that. But Pittsburghs do love to talk about weather in general, and especially snowfall. You know, the panic. Oh, I need bread. I need milk. Buy toilet paper and milk. And I'm not sure why. I've lived here all my life. I've never been snowed in for more than maybe a few hours but I got a pallet of toilet paper out back, just in case. But if you drink enough milk, <laughs> why we do that, that's strange to me. I think most people really just want to know, do I need my umbrella? Well, we love weather because we get so many crappy days here that when we have a good one, you gotta plan a ton of crap, man. I mean, you have to fit in weeks worth of adventure into the four sunny days of the summer, you know? It's gonna like, we got a picnic, we got a softball game. All right, you got the jart set. Uh, we're gonna go boating tonight. You know, your Uncle Chew's got a, he's got, he's got a, he's got an outboard motor on a cardboard raft. We're gonna go out there tomorrow down at Yawkagani. <laughs> All right, so Randy is right. When it's sunny out like this, you do have to cram a lot of stuff into the day. All right, so getting around and weather could be a little troublesome, but I think one thing we can all get behind is the curious Pittsburgh tradition known as the parking chair. Apparently, William Pitt, when he founded the city said, in a snowstorm, if you have taken the time to shovel the space in front of your house to park, you are allowed to reserve that space by putting a chair there so no one else can park. And for the most part, people abide by it. You know, there are occasional scoff laws who move the chair, but for the most part, people go, oh, that's that guy's spot, you know? You know, I think the chair has more meaning than when the city comes and puts like, you know, this, this you, know, you can't park here. Some genius, somewhere along the line, we don't know who it is. It's like, do we really know who invented cable? I don't know. <laughs> The genius put a chair out one day. I guess I had noticed it down here, you know, when I'd come down as a kid, and I just thought that that was sort of like what you did in big cities. It comes from more or less when you live in the row house type thing, setting, like you have a lot of those on the south side. You don't have a garage, and it's your space. They're not relics. People do it all the time. People like to think, oh, that was a quaint old thing about Pittsburgh, uh-uh. I do like a, something a little bit sturdier, like a heavier wood, because nobody wants to move a nice chair. Preferably, if you're serious about this, you want to go with kitchen chair. I have seen the folding chair. Anything that can fold up, yeah, that can, you know, that's, there's some, uh, there's some question there as to whether or not that's an actual legitimate space holding chair. A recliner is going a little bit too far. That's going into West Virginia. But if you really want to make a statement, go with the, the hard edged, you know, padded, but like, you know, aluminum kind of leg kind of thing, kitchen chair. But a good rigid diner chair, which you'll see on the south side, mostly stolen from the diners, uh, that's, you know, gonna work uh, most of the time and it usually seems to be the most commonplace. 
The parking chairs are, are definitely more or less existent in the south side than any other area that I've noticed. I've seen it a lot in Lawrenceville, I've seen it in Stanton Heights, I've seen it in Bloomfield, but surprisingly they do do it in Shady Side, though the chairs are a much nicer quality. I haven't seen anything other than a chair because I think that it is so well established that you use a chair to denote it's your parking space. If you were trying to put an upside down garbage can out there, you would have traffic backed up while three guys sat there and tried to figure out, what does that mean? Can we park here? You think them guys just threw that over there when he was emptying our garbage earlier? I can't stand the parking chairs. However, I will not move those chairs. If you move a chair, there's a common, a lot of feelings, a lot of emotion. You know, uh, first hurt, then anger. And that's what, ha you know, you don't want anger because then the person who lives in the house, usually their grandmother, they send out the front lines to yell at you. I'm always afraid to move them because if I do, I think some lady's going to come out with a broom and hit me. And if you get shamed by a Pittsburgh grandma, there's nothing that hurts worse. I mean, it's worse than mustard gas, getting shamed by a Pittsburgh grandmother. You cannot wash it off, my friend. My view of it is they're the same people that have the chairs out there are the ones that yell, get that dog off my lawn. Here's what I found with parking chairs. It's that um, the, the bigger and heavier the chair, the more damage will be done to your car should you decide to ignore it. So if it's a lawn chair that's parked there, eh, you can get out, maybe move the lawn chair, park there, you might get keyed, all right? If it, it, if it's like one of those iron, like wrought iron chairs that is sitting there, that will be through the window if you dare to park there. And if it's like an old lazy boy, you know what I mean? Like that people like take off the patio and throw it down there, your car will be gone. It will not be there when you get back. That is, I mean, that is squatter's rights if there ever was any here in Pittsburgh. Once you throw something in a parking space, you can't park there. All right, so now after watching this program, I now know to never move a chair in front of Randy Bauman's house. <laughs> and Dave, you know who else would never even touch a parking chair? Mr. Rogers. And we were lucky enough to really get to work with him for a few years. And I'd have to say, he's definitely our favorite neighbor. Oh my gosh, I love Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Let me tell you, one of my dreams growing up was to be in his neighborhood. I wanted to walk down his street, ride the trolley, put on that sweater, and flip my sneaker and catch it. Like, that's what I wanted. Well, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood started, really, in 1954 as the Children's Corner, right here at QED. In 1967 is when we started taping uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, right? In the old building, as they say, down on Fifth Avenue. I think there are lots of theories about what people connect with on Mr. Rogers. Some people like the pacing, some people like, you know, the, the crazy puppets and that kind of stuff. But I know what sort of makes me turn towards it um, is like that Johnny Costa music. When I went away on MTV, I took a picture of Fred with me. He really is my friend. He speaks to the child in all of us. And I think that's why that show was, was so amazing and still is today. If I find it on now, I'll stop and watch it and uh, sing along. Won't you be my neighbor? Hi, neighbor. I, I actually would challenge myself to see if I could remember the whole song, like now that I have kids. And I think that he can connect with adults and children at the same time. There are many people who can do that. He always said that the distance between the television set and the child at home was sort of holy ground. You know, you can grow up and you see Mr. Rogers and you feel safe. And in this world today, there aren't many places you can feel safe. I gotta admit to you guys, it was relaxing, it is relaxing when I see reruns of it. I, I like watching it now. <laughs> it's relaxing, I'm, you know. People in Pittsburgh are very proud that the neighborhood comes from, from Pittsburgh. I think every kid probably thinks he's from their neighborhood, you know. <laughs> Just the fact that he was in Pittsburgh, oh yeah. You know, it's like, of course. I was in uh, Roanoke, Virginia about two weeks ago. and. The people who had come up to me thought it was made in New York City or Los Angeles because people think that. Andy Warhol is a famous Pittsburgher, but I think Fred Rogers is probably more famous. Fred chose to stay here too. He didn't want to leave Pittsburgh. He wanted to stay at QED and do the program for here because he loved the feeling of Pittsburgh. Looking back on it now as an adult with children, I mean, you go back and you say, you know, he really 
had you use your imagination, which a lot of you know children don't now. I mean, they just sit in front of the TV and watch you know show after show or video games, and this that this show actually helped you imagine, which you know children are getting away from. So I mean that he was ahead of his time back then. My mom is a nanny. She watched his kids. She's always watched kids, and she has memorabilia all over our, the house I grew up in. And we all feel like he's a part of our family. Off camera, he was a delightful, delightful man and really used television as a vehicle. It, he wanted, his mission was to, to get important messages and materials to families with young children. And that television enabled him to do that. I don't think I've ever met a man who was so truly, genuinely good. I remember a priest once telling me what, in the Catholic religion, what a saint was, a saint the definition of a saint is a 100% first-rate human being. Yeah, underline human being. And, um, and there are saints amongst us. I remember this priest telling us. And I remember after meeting Mr. Rogers, and I met, thought, that's, that's what that guy is, right there. That's a 100% first-rate human being. Well, we really miss uh, Mr. Rogers. I mean, we really do. That's just a great, great part of, of Pittsburgh history, and uh, we all should be very proud of it. Well, Dave, I could not have said that better myself. I agree. All right, so in this program, we talked a lot about the things that we love about this city. So for the last part of the show, we thought, let's ask our 13 local celebrities what their favorite thing about the city is. And their answer was unanimous. The people. I honestly think the people. I know it's very cliche as to say the people. Uh, I, I like the attitude of Pittsburghers. Um, they are fiercely loyal. They are fiercely proud. They are fiercely provincial. And I like that. It doesn't matter where you go or who you meet. Everyone is always so friendly. I think most people would tell you that they're uh, as likable, uh, friendly, uh, outgoing as any place you're ever going to find, really, maybe in the world. They're just straightforward people. Uh, they're, they're loyal. But I think that the character of the people of this town is unique and, and I've been around. Uh, I think that's the thing that struck me first when I first came here is that you could walk into any place and people were willing to talk to you first of all. They'll talk to you about things you don't even want to talk to them about. You know this city has a warmth and a genuineness that you do not get anywhere else. You know being from New York people don't even speak to each other. It's like the nicest people in the whole world came to Pittsburgh and they've never left. One day I was walking down the street and there was this very little, 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 little old lady standing at the bus stop and I walked past and she said, smile so everyone can see your dimples. That's not a normal thing to say, but it was really sweet. It was weird, but it was really, really sweet. I, I've lived in many other different cities of, across the Northeast and in the South and there's just something about the people of Pittsburgh. They're genuine. They'll tell you exactly what they're thinking. Um, exactly what they're feeling. They'll, they'll, if you're stranded on the side of the road, they'll come and help you. So if you come here and you're aloof or uh, uh, standoffish, this is not the place for you. In order to be hip, you can't have pretensions of being hip. And no one in Pittsburgh has any pretensions of being hip. And I think that's part of our charm. We don't think of ourselves as especially special. You know, the one thing when you consider all the good things about Pittsburgh that's consistent is uh, the people, the general hardworking ethic and the kindness. And we got a pretty good sense of humor with a low tolerance for BS. Pittsburgh is just a part of me. It's a part of every person that's from this city. It's just amazing to me how many people come back here to live. They may have gone away, but they always seem to come back. And the people who have gone away and haven't come back have no other choice. Given an option, you know, they left to find work and times were tough here. But people always identify with Pittsburgh. While we're living here, sometimes we don't realize how charming and special Pittsburgh is. You just never lose the tie. That's what I think is so terrific about this place. It's home. It's home for me, and that's what's the favorite thing for me. It's Pittsburgh. It doesn't get much better than this place. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Julie Bologna from WPXI. I'm going to be part of a special show called. Hey, don't use that. <laughs> hey, look at him. We got a kiss. <laughs> Excuse me. I burped again. I'm very gassy today. Okay, that's the Pop Tarts talking to you, by the way. 
<laughs> in three, two. I'm Julie Bologna from WPXI. I'm going to move. Uh, well, we've got openings there and there. I'm Larry Richard from KDKA Radio, excited to be a part of a show called Pittsburgh and That with Dave and Dave and Friends. That'll be Wednesday, October 6th at 8 on WQED. First of all, it's Thursday, November 6th at 8. What did I say? Wednesday. Wednesday, October 6th. Holy <laughs> You stink. I'm Julie Bologna from WPXI. I'm going to be part of a show. Am I jabbering too much? No, it's no, all good. good. You're jabbering just the right amount. Okay. I'm Julie Bologna from WPXI, and I'm going to be part of a special show called Dave and Dave and Matt and Friends. Is that no? <laughs> you're, cl you're close. <laughs> You're getting me on like four hours sleep too. I'm just being an idiot. I'm sorry. Three, two. Three, two, one. This is this is really bringing out a lot of rage in me. All these questions. You're gonna use all the mess ups, aren't you? Don't use the mess ups. <laughs> Cut. If I run out of topics, what will Dave and Dave do? They've been stealing topics for so many years that they will not have anything to do. You know, they come in all the time and say, Rick, we've done all the belts, now what should we do? I'm Julie Bologna from WPXI, and I'm going to be part of a show called Pittsburgh and That with Dave and Dave and Friends. It's Thursday night, November 6th at 8 on WQED. Yay, finally! <laughs>